Great, thanks so much. Uh, pleasure to be here. So I'm going to be talking to you about a technology which is currently not being widely used, either really for research purposes or in clinical applications. But it's a technology that I believe is coming. And it's very different in many ways from the technology you're familiar with. So I'm going to take my time with you today to explain to you a little bit what this technology is capable of. And we can talk about some applications later in the day. So I'm talking about, of course, wearable cameras, which increasingly are feasible to deploy in populations as part of a research study or even a treatment program. And there's just a tremendous number of these devices on the market. And many more are coming. So imagine we have someone willing to wear this pivot head glass, as you see here in the bottom right, with a little camera right here at the bridge of the nose. What kinds of questions could we ask with this new sensor? So here's a list of some ideas. And my lab has been doing a lot of work in this area and addressing a lot of these different questions around where a person is located in their environment, what they might be doing, what kinds of things they're able to see, what they're attending to within their visual field to measure the visual exposure, and so forth. And it turns out all of these questions can be answered using technology from computer vision, uh, which is the business of analyzing images to learn about the world. But you've got you've to specialize and sort of apply these methods in a certain way to, to, to treat the unique properties of these wearable cameras. Now, for this meeting, I'll focus in on one particular set of questions around mobility, namely, how can you understand how a person is moving to their environment by doing a very fine-grained analysis of the, vi of the video that they're producing and capturing, what they're seeing as they move around? OK, so this is a problem known as SLAM. And it's a timely, uh, it's, a, it's a good point in time to talk about SLAM, because this technology is getting very mature in the last 10 years and may be ready for certain new applications that haven't been tried out yet. So I want to just spend a little minute to explain to you what, what is the SLAM problem and how does it work. So the basic idea comes from robotics. So a robot moving in an unknown environment has to both map its environment, build a map, and understand where it's located in that map as a function of time. And there's been a lot of research that's produced results like you see here, a robot moving inside some kind of indoor laboratory, mapping out the boundaries of the walls as it moves around. And this technology is getting very mature, and both in terms of deployment on very small platforms and in terms of accuracy. So I'll take a minute and just explain to you kind of intuitively, how is this possible from a moving camera to figure out where a person is in their environment and what's around them? And here's the basic idea. It all comes down to triangulation. So the starting point is there's a robot, you can see here, and there's a landmark. And a landmark is any sort of three-dimensional structure in the environment that you can identify and recognize as you, as you move through the environment. Now, this robot gets a bearing to the landmark, so it knows where the landmark is. It might know the distance, depending on the sensor, it might just know the direction. And one landmark is not enough, but luckily there's tons of landmarks in the environment. And so if you can imagine the robot getting two bearings here to two landmarks, and imagine for the moment that we actually know the location of these landmarks, then through some, some mathematics you can actually localize where is the robot. So where is the position of this robot in its environment spatially? Now the robot moves ahead and it goes to a new location and it sees additional bearings to landmarks. And once again, if we know the landmarks, we can actually localize this robot. Now notice this bottom landmark here um, has actually been, been, been imaged or, or, or has been fixed from two robot locations. So that bottom landmark, we can actually imagine knowing the robot positions and then being able to do a simple triangulation, just intersection of lines, to figure out where this landmark is located. And that's called solving the correspondence problem, figuring out that this same location in space has actually been viewed from two different positions. So you can kind of see the structure of this. So if we know the landmarks, we can actually figure out where the robot is going. So we can get this trajectory over time. And if we know the robot positions, we can actually triangulate and localize all the landmarks, all the 3D points in the environment. And there's a ton of algorithms that are out there for essentially solving this coupled set of problems, fixing the robot, solving for the landmarks, and vice versa, iterating this until it converges to a complete map of the environment and the position of the robot over time. OK, so I'm not going to go into all the details, but there's a really some quite mature software now that can do this very reliably. And of course, we're interested in doing this with images. So given a video of someone moving in their environment, we'd like to know where they are and what they're seeing. And this is an example from some work at Cornell. This is showing a, a, a series of images taken from a building. And what's happening here is every single image is giving you literally hundreds or thousands of landmarks. And as we match those points across these images, we can actually recover the three-dimensional shape of this building as a point cloud. And we can localize exactly where these cameras are positioned over time. So this is now a way to get very fine-grained information about how a camera is moving in space. And if the camera is literally being worn in your head, we're now getting a very fine-grained picture of your motion through your environment. 
So we've been exploring this technology in my lab uh, with these wearable cameras, and there's a variety of technical challenges that need to be overcome that I'm not going to go sort of deeply into. But I want to show you a kind of simple preliminary result. So this is a little stroll through the Georgia Tech campus on a beautiful weekend morning, and my student is wearing a camera, and what you're going to see on the left are all the landmarks that are being essentially tracked and localized in this, in this process. So these are all locations that we have a fix on, and we can actually tell you their 3D position in the world, and we can then determine the camera motion on the right. You can see the blue set of trajectories there is the position of the camera, and these are evolving in time and being mapped out based on these feature correspondences. So we can build this very nice sort of trajectory that shows the path the person took, you can see a change of elevation there as they go down the steps. You can see them turning and moving through the environment in a particular way. And this can be done in a very detailed and potentially very accurate way uh, by exploiting these cameras. So this is some uh, kind of technology. We're using a method here that, was, that appeared uh, last year that's a, a nice solution in terms of the computational cost and, 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 the, and the way that you can deploy it. And there's lots of work that's, that's in the works, uh, including some work at Georgia Tech to make this technology better. Okay, so you can think of this as uh, a kind of a slam for wearable cameras. And you can think about a variety of possible applications of this technology. Okay, so I'm a technologist, so I'm very interested in sort of how we can measure things in new ways and measure new things. This is just a list of some, you know, pretty obvious ideas of things one might do. And I'd, be, I'd love to talk to you folks and figure out if any of these things are, are useful or not and what else we might be able to do, you know, to address your particular challenges. But one thing we can do with this technology is we can get this very accurate motion estimation, even in cases where GPS is not available, where you can't sort of get that global fix uh, using the GPS system. Um, we can easily detect, detect individual footfalls uh, in this data. They just sort of leap out of the data. Um, you can also think about how does the person's camera change in elevation during a step? So how does they move up or down if they're climbing stairs, for example? And we can potentially say a lot about surface properties. So what kind of material are they walking over? Is it sand? Is it asphalt? What condition is it in? How rough is it? And so on. All of these things are potentially possible uh, given this modality. Okay, so that's sort of the sort of quick tour of how you might think about leveraging robotics technology to understand movement in a 3D environment using a camera. And I want to briefly talk about a few other things that might be done with the same types of sensors. So another idea is to look at not just the structure of the scene, but actually the semantics, which means the kind of stuff that's in your environment. So here's an example from robotics. This is a driving a vehicle through an urban environment. You can see the, the volumetric reconstruction here of the urban scene the robot is passing through. And the color codes that are flashing in are actually labels. So the red objects are buildings. The kind of light purple object is the street. The, purple, the darker purple objects are cars. The blue is the sidewalk, and so on. So this is a technology for saying not just what kind of 3D scene are you moving through, but actually what are the properties of this scene? What are the objects? What are the kinds of structures that you're actually moving through? And we're developing uh, this technology further and doing some object level analysis and other things. So this is another thing that's kind of coming, if you will. Now, one exciting uh, dimension that I think we'll hear about today a lot more is the integration of modalities. So camera is one type of sensor, but increasingly vendors are producing platforms that combine multiple sensors in a single package. And there hasn't been a lot of work yet to really integrate those sensors, but that's a very exciting direction to pursue. And here I'm going to talk briefly about integrating an IMU, which you're probably all familiar with because it's increasingly in smartphones and so on. And it's also increasingly in these wearable glasses. And so it gives you the ability to measure the acceleration, the rotational velocity uh, simultaneously with the images. And it turns out this can be used to make this imaging approach much more reliable in the face of certain technical problems. And it can also be used to measure other types of variables uh, in, a, in the same kind of head-worn sensor platform. And I'll just mention briefly a piece of work that we did recently with Ross Picard's group at MIT. And this was about looking at the very subtle movement of the head that comes from the heart and the lung action and using that to get a sense of the pulse wave and the respiration wave in a head-worn wearable system. So we've got some data. I guess it didn't show up here on the slide very well, but it, it matches fairly well with a sort of laboratory-based measure in the case where people are basically very still. Okay, so the opposite of, of, your, of the goal of, this, of people in this room. But this is kind of, again, an emerging technology that one might imagine exploiting, that it has the advantage of being mobile, you can carry it around with you, and then perhaps assay physiological function as well as movement through space in the same kind of sensor package. That's the part that I think is potentially very interesting. And we're continuing this work at Georgia Tech with my collaborator, Dr. Omar Enan, in, in EC department. 
And so lastly, I'll talk about one thing relating to kind of activity and attention. Um, and this is some work of my student, Yin Lee. And the idea is to look at people performing everyday activities like cooking or activities of daily living, and then trying to understand both what are they doing and where are they attending when they're actually performing these activities. And so what you see on the left is a kind of typical activity in my lab, making scrambled eggs. Um, and then the green dot is actually a kind of gold standard gaze tracking measure from a pair of wearable eye tracking glasses. But the little colorful bullseye is actually the output of my student's algorithm, Yin's algorithm, which predicts where someone is looking based only on the video, only on the pixels, with no actual eye measurement at all. So it's kind of a magic trick, and I can tell you how we do it if you're interested. Um, and the idea is to make these sensors more flexible so they can give us not just what you're seeing, but actually where you might be attending under certain conditions. And we can also recognize the activities in the same way. So just to wrap things up, um, there's this technology which is coming. Uh, it, it may be useful, I think it could be useful, um, involving wearable cameras. And it's potentially very flexible, and there's a lot of open space here to explore ways it might be employed or utilized in a variety of applications. And I'd love to talk to you all about that later today. Thank you. <laughs>